we have to give um, people credit in the first century. These people were not morons. They would not have followed somebody that was a charlatan, a liar, or a fake. You mentioned earlier the concept of imaginative storytelling that you're, when you went in to give your thesis and they, they offered that it might have just been imaginative storytelling. I mean, it seems to me that it would have been very difficult for Christianity to get off the ground if it was just mm-hmm. imaginative storytelling. Um, and, and one of the things that, that you touch on in your book, which is I'm really interested in right now, I'm kind of fascinated by this idea because sometimes skeptics, when you mention the resurrection, they might say something like, well, the, the disciples were just trying to save face or they were trying to redeem the whole thing by making up this story of a resurrection. You know, they thought Jesus was going to do all these things and then he died. So they had to kind of make good out of it. Um, but, but you point out in your book that that's, that, that would be very out of character, uh, for the Jewish mindset, uh, from back then. Talk a little bit about that and how you might answer that. If somebody said, well, it's just imaginative storytelling. Yeah. The way that we answer this question thinks, oh, the gospel writers were just making it up. If they made up the resurrection stories that are embedded in the four gospels, they did a terrible job. Um, we have female witnesses that not only witness Jesus' resurrection, females are the first to touch him, to dine with him. Um, you wouldn't start there if you knew anything about uh, Greco-Roman Empire and even even the, even Jews in Judaica, you wouldn't begin there. I mean, I think of Rabbi Judah who said, better to burn the Torah than teach it to a woman. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not agreeing with that, obviously. Right. I'm just saying you, we, have to, we have to see the New Testament world with first century eyes. It is so important that we understand that we don't import a modern Jesus or a modern Western understanding into the first century understanding. And that's why in my book, Body of Proof, I wanted to lay out these seven reasons. And you're asking me one of the best questions right now. What if it is imaginative storytelling? What do we say to that? Well, in Luke chapter 24, verse 21 the uh, on the road to Emmaus, and I've been there in the land of Israel. In fact, I've been at the, the tombs near the town of Emmaus. Um, the one of them, we actually have their name. So we have eyewitness testimony here, Cleopas. Um, they don't realize they're walking with the resurrected Jesus, and they said they're dejected. They said, you know, we had hoped he was the re- he was the Messiah, but you know, he died, and it's done. There's a mm-hmm. finality to it. They have truly given up, and they they're walking seven miles home. And also see the symbolism, they're walking away from this faith as well. No one expected the Messiah to die, Elisa. And this is where I want to really help our audience as a professor. We open up Isaiah 53 today in our scriptures, and it just seems so clear that Mm -hmm. this is the coming suffering servant. Very few Jews in Jesus's day would have interpreted Isaiah 53 the way that we see it now with the historical and theological hindsight. In fact, If we go to sources that I know you've taught your audience about, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, 4Q285, and other scrolls as well, that just means Qumran K4, scroll 285, we see that there are actual prophecies in the Dead Sea Scrolls community that when Messiah comes, not only would he be a great conqueror, he would kill the Katim, he would kill the Romans, that was their name for the Romans, he would even kill the Roman emperor. He would not die on a cross. No one expected Messiah to die. And this is why it's fascinating. And I know we've discussed it at one of our recent conferences with our colleague and friend, Craig Evans. There were many messianic pretenders in the first year, first two centuries of nascent Christianity. Yeah. They were contenders or pretenders. Jesus wasn't the only one who went around and said, hey, I'm the Messiah. Follow me. Others did. In fact, we have two that are named in the book of Acts and their following went away. The only reason that Christianity carried on, and I want to make sure our audience doesn't miss this fact, is because of the resurrection. All they did was report what actually happened because it really did, and that started the movement. Mm -hmm. Um, When we talk about Christianity, yes, we can talk about experiencing God, and we should, but we also should never forget that there is a content to be believed. It's not just all experiential. Faith is used in two ways in the New Testament. Yes, we have an experience with God, absolutely. But make no mistake, there is facts, as J.I. Packer famously said in a sermon on Romans 7 and 8. We trust in the facts of the gospel, and that content doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, those facts of the resurrection of Jesus literally birthed the new church that changed the world. 
Yeah, you mentioned the conference we were at together, and it was such a joy to get to hang out with all of you guys. And Sean McDowell was there and Alan Parr. And um, I just remember being in the green room sitting next to Craig Evans, uh, who, you know, I've I've just looked up to and admired so much of his work for so Me long. Too. And yeah, and he was talking about those messianic figures that sort of came and went. And what really was fascinating to me, and I hope that I will be able to articulate this accurately as he told it to me. Um, I'd love to get him on the show to even talk more about it, but it's not just that we have these theoretical pretenders, right? As you mentioned, the Book of Acts even mentions a couple by name, but he mentioned one by name that, and, and he was talking about the Jewish response to it. And not only was their instinct not to try to redeem the whole thing or, you know, smooth it all over and make this guy into some kind of Messiah, but with one of them when he died, if I'm remembering this accurately, they even changed his name to include mm -hmm. some sort of a connotation of being an actual liar. I mean, that was the Jewish yes. response. Had Jesus not raised from the dead, uh, all indication we have from history is that they would have turned on him and he would have been a liar in in their eyes. And that was such powerful to me evidence for the resurrection because I'd never heard something like that before. Well, and that's a great point that, again, many of us don't know until we really study these things at serious uh, levels. And, and part of reason number two in my book, Body of Proof, I actually point out some of these uh, additional messianic pretenders. I said we had 10. Uh, the Gospels record Thutis in Acts 538. And then we also hear in AD 56 about this anonymous Egyptian. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness? Well, that's Acts 2138. And so we have to give um, people credit in the first century. These people were not morons. They would not have followed somebody that was a charlatan, a liar, or a fake. And again, I cannot make this clear enough. They certainly would not have made up a resurrection narrative if it wasn't true. How can we say that? Nobody believed in physical bodily resurrection outside of Jews in the first century who believed in a coming general resurrection. And this is where we have to be so careful. Nobody thought that Jesus was physically or a Messiah was going to die and rise again. This was something that was going to happen eschatologically speaking at the end of days. Um, why would you start your narrative there if it didn't really happen and if nobody would have believed it to begin with? And so we have to ask ourselves these questions like you're asking about these messianic contenders. No, they wouldn't have followed him. They would rename him. He's not the son of the star. He's a liar. Um, you know, and so we have to understand that. And then you're getting into something, too. There's there's no psychological motivation to make up a resurrection narrative, which is one of my points in the book as well. 